Romans had a story they told about how they marched out each year, usually to deal with somebody else's provocation, and then fought a battle, often despite with some reluctance, won the battle, and then stayed where they were. And so their, their empire, rather like the story of the British Empire in the way it was told in the, first, in the 20th century, uh, was a kind of accident that the favour of the gods and a series of incompetent but aggressive neighbours had led Rome to run things. Now, we don't tell the story of Rome like that anymore, but we are interested in what makes the empire stay after the battle's been won. Winning a battle isn't that unusual. In fact, it's not very unusual for Romans to lose battles. But what makes them different from their opponents and their competitors, if you like, is that Rome doesn't seem to be too dismayed by the defeats and capitalise on the success. So what are the, what are the, what are the institutions, what are the structures that sustain empire, that keep it going, that turns it from an aggressive set of conquest into something much more stable? And to look at that, you can't look just at the favour of the gods and the, and the, f the phenomenal power of Roman armies uh, or the virtue of the generals. You have to look at the key institutions that somehow became assembled into an empire without anybody consciously planning it. Now, there's quite a few you could talk about. You could talk about the way the Roman economy operates. You could talk about uh, transport infrastructure, the way information is exchanged. But one of the central ones is, is one that um, has a much more sort of dark tone, and this is the use that slavery had in running an empire. Romans, like lots of their neighbours, had taken captives in war and made them work as slaves in the fields. And they'd also, as their farms grew bigger and as their businesses got more complicated, had started running them not just through their families, meaning their children and their relatives and their cousins, but also through slaves and ex-slaves. And that became a kind of pattern that could be used for almost anything. Now, there are some institutions that are so central to our society, we're not even conscious of them anymore. Things like the committee, or the meeting, um, or the telephone conversation. The Romans didn't use any of those things for pretty obvious reasons. But something that was so central to their society, they hardly noticed it was slavery. So when one of the generals found himself winning the last civil war, Augustus, and ruling the entire empire, how did he decide to run it? Did he set up a committee? No. Did he set up a department or an office of state? Absolutely not. No such things existed. Were the bureaucracies? Not really in a modern sense. What he did was he got his sons to, to, to lead the armies when he was too old to do so himself, and he got his slaves and ex-slaves to run the imperial economy. There's a great moment in the biography of the first Roman Emperor Augustus, the last chapter of his life. And at that moment, um, his will is read out to the Roman Senate. Uh, all the gifts to the people, and there's a huge list also produced of where all the armies are and how much revenue there is and what money is still owing, which is a bit surprising. You might think the Senate might know these things already, but no, it's all been kept quiet. Augustus has been doing it. And then, it, at the bottom of this document, he added the names of the former slaves, of the ex-slaves in his own household, who could provide further details if anybody wanted to know. And that's amazingly revealing. This entire Roman Empire has been run through its longest reign for 40 years by one man and his household slaves. And they're the only people who know where the money is, where the soldiers are, and all the rest of it. So Roman Empire, the Roman Empire is a slave empire in the sense of an empire that depends on slaves the way we depend on telephones and committees and paperwork just to run itself.